Uh, the next, uh, the new speaker uh, is uh, Jacopo Nieda. Uh, Jacopo got uh, his uh, master degree in 2019 uh, at uh, La Sapienza with Giovanni Montani, working on uh, the semi-classical approach to the problem of time in quantum gravity. And uh, now he is doing uh, uh, a PhD uh, uh, at Sapienza, uh, working uh, with Luca Leuzzi and Giacomo Gradenigo. And uh, today uh, he is going to speak about glass and pseudo localization transitions in the model of the spin model for random lasers. Jacopo, yeah, please. Okay, thank you very much for the kind uh, invitation. Um, okay, uh, this work has been done in collaboration with uh, Giacomo Gradenigo and Luca Leuzzi, which were my uh, PhD supervisors, uh, and uh, with uh, Giorgio Parisi. So this is a quick uh, outline of my talk. First, I will give you some motivations for this work, and then I will uh, introduce what random lasers are. Um, I will introduce the spin glass model for random lasers, and then uh, I will uh, present new results from numerical simulations. So this work is part of a larger uh, project uh, devoted to the modelization of optical waves in random media in the framework of spin glass theory. And the goal is twofold. On one hand, uh, it is aimed at describing the random lasing phenomenon in terms of a glass transition. And on the other hand, uh, it is aimed at using uh, uh, this theory to corroborate experimental evidence of replica symmetry breaking. So uh, the order parameter for replica symmetry breaking is the overlap uh, uh, distribution function. Uh, the overlap is a quantity which gives information uh, on the um, state uh, of the system, and its distribution is typically peaked around zero uh, in, a high temperature in a high temperature regime, whereas it develops a more uh, complex uh, structure in the low temperature uh, phase. However, um, we have um, experimental issues with glasses and, uh, and spin glasses um, that lead to no experimental measure of uh, the overlap distribution function. And there are many reasons for this. Um, one first reason is that microscopic configurations are very hard to be, measures, to be measured in these systems. Uh, the theory of replica symmetry breaking is only exact for uh, mean field models, whereas this, uh, these uh, systems are intrinsically, uh, intrinsically finite dimensional due to the short, uh, short range nature of the interactions. Moreover, they are characterized by an extremely slow dynamics uh, towards equilibrium, which is hardly or uh, never attained. Uh, and as we will see, all these issues can be better addressed uh, with, uh, with random lasers. So let me come to the, in, to the introduction. Let me introduce you random lasers. So um, you have a random laser where, where uh, when optical power is pumped into a random medium, uh, energy, the, the, the energy can be uh, injected either continuously or in a pulsed uh, way. And examples of uh, random media can, uh, can be colloidals, powders, or, uh, or polymers. Uh, the two uh, basic ingredients for the uh, lasing action are the optical activity, which is uh, uh, provided by energy injection uh, in, the, in the system, which sustains the atomic population inversion, uh, which is necessary for a stimulated emission, and the feedback, a feedback mechanism, which in, uh, in random lasers uh, is, uh, is provided by the multiple scattering of light uh, inside the medium. Uh, which confines uh, the light uh, inside the medium and ensures the presence of modes of the electromagnetic field. Uh, in standard laser, the feedback mechanism is usually uh, provided by mirrors. So ma random lasers are, we can say that they are mirrorless, but not modeless. So the, the, the discrete part of the spectrum of the electromagnetic field can be decomposed in normal modes where we have uh, complex amplitudes and uh, a very complex distribution of, uh, of uh, spatial distribution of the, of the modes. So the key features of random lasers can be uh, summarized in the following uh, points. We have nonlinear disorder interactions uh, among the modes. We have multimodality, so there are many modes with different wave number k. And moreover, the lacing regime is stable and stationary due to gain saturation. These two last features are, uh, are key features uh, for developing a thermodynamic theory of, this, uh, of these systems. 
But with respect to what I told you about uh, uh, structural spin glasses, why are random lasers useful? Well, because they are characterized by long range disorder interactions. Uh, so they are good candidates to be mean field models. Uh, they are characterized by a very fast dynamics towards equilibrium. And moreover, uh, spectra are available. And from spectra, we can gain information on the microscopic configuration of the electromagnetic field. So here I uh, show experimental spectra taken from different uh, uh, values of the, uh, of the pumping. Uh, of, of the bumping energy uh, and for uh, different uh, shot of, 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 uh, of the pumping, but all from the same piece of material. So first, you can notice that uh, there is a, a transition from a fluorescence regime where the spectrum is uh, only affected by the gain profile of the medium to a regime uh, to, to a regime where the, the spectrum na narrows around the central modes, um, and this is a, the, the, the random raising, the random lasing uh, uh, regime. Therefore, um, um, okay, uh, the, the, the thing to notice is that uh, um, below a, a, a threshold value of, uh, of the pumping energy, all uh, the spectra are all equal, whereas uh, above uh, a threshold value of the pumping energy, they develop shot-to-shot uh, -shot fluctuations. So for sure, if you uh, illuminate different uh, parts of the, of the material, you get shot-to-shot uh, -shot fluctuations, but the, 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 this is completely expected because there is disorder in the medium. Whereas uh, from the same piece of material with the disorder kept fixed, you still have uh, uh, fluctuations among different uh, shots, spectral shots. So these uh, spectral fluctuations can be uh, interpreted as the presence of uh, many uh, degenerate lasing states, which can be interpreted as replicas. So one can see the fluorescence regime of the random lasers as a paramagnetic state where there is only one minimum, uh, whereas the random lasing regime uh, is characterized by uh, a, a multi-equilibria uh, phase. So in order to uh, understand if the onset of random lasing is a glass transition, we have to develop a spin glass uh, model uh, for these systems. Uh, moreover, overlaps among lasing states are experimentally available. You, you just have to compute the overlaps among the, the intensity fluctuations. And so uh, uh, we need a spin glass theory to bridge with, the, with this experiment. So the, the starting point for uh, um, a spin glass theory of random laser is this uh, uh, Langevin equation for the amplitude of, uh, of the modes, where uh, both a two-body term, uh, a two-body interaction term appears and a four-body interaction term. And here it is expressed in the slow amplitude mode basis, which is uh, optimal for describing uh, uh, lasing modes, uh, since lasing modes are characterized by uh, having a, a frequency which is uh, uh, very peaked around their proper frequency. The effect of, uh, of uh, taking this, uh, this basis is that uh, we have a, a, a time scale separation among the fast oscillation of the modes and the dynamics of, of the amplitudes. And as a result, uh, we have this uh, uh, frequency matching condition on the modes that uh, participate to the interactions. And I will come back on this in a while. So if you consider the purely, dis so in, in general, the, the, the couplings are uh, complex. Uh, um, so if you conceive, consider uh, the purely dissipative limit, so you only take uh, the uh, real part of the couplings and you implement gain saturation, uh, for example, through a spherical constraint, uh, then you have an Hamiltonian uh, dynamics and, uh, and you can describe the stationary regime of, of, of these systems. Uh, so this model, uh, I would like to stress that there's uh, some uh, features in common with the spherical 2 plus p uh, spin uh, model and uh, uh, an XY model where, because it has both moduli and, and, uh, and phases. So uh, th this model can be uh, derived uh, from uh, the semi-classical theory of, uh, of uh, random, laser, uh, random lasers. I don't want to enter into the detail now, but uh, our, our quantum theory of this system has to take into account the openness of the system. Um, 
which leads to radiative losses and the disorder of the medium. So a typical way of, uh, uh, of approaching open quantum systems is to consider this system and path decomposition, where uh, in our case, the system is uh, uh, comprised by the discrete part of the spectrum, which is confined in the, in the, inside the cavity, where, whereas the path is the, is, um, is the, it's, um, uh, it's comprised by the radiative uh, uh, part of the spectrum. And uh, the interactions among the, uh, the modes which are confined inside the, the cavity and the modes which uh, radiates away uh, gives a linear damping uh, to, the, to the modes inside the, uh, inside the cavity, which uh, corresponds to the diagonal uh, terms of, of our Hamiltonian. Uh, the disorder of the, uh, of the medium can be uh, treated in the, in the semi-classical uh, uh, approximation where light uh, is treated uh, with the electromagnetic, the electromagnetic field is uh, considered classical while matter is uh, uh, treated as quantum. And if you do the third order pertur perturbation theory in the amplitudes of the mode, you find these couplings which basically uh, are given by the spatial overlap of the eigenfunctions uh, of uh, the electromagnetic field mediated by the atomic uh, uh, density distribution. However, these couplings are too hard to compute, so uh, one can, since in many random lasers um, we have evidence of, a, of modes which are extended all over the, 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 the volume of, of the medium, we can just uh, consider that all the modes interact with, uh, with uh, each other from the point of view of, uh, of, uh, of these couplings, and they can be extracted from a, from a Gaussian distribution. So uh, if you consider extended modes, the frequency matching condition is the only uh, selection rule which affects and, and defines the topology of the interaction graph. And here I, I report the frequency matching condition for uh, uh, the four-body term of the Hamiltonian. And if you consider a frequency comb, uh, which is uh, represented by this uh, kind of, uh, uh, of, of spectrum where each frequency is uh, well separated by, uh, by the others and, and equispaced, uh, then this condition can be mapped on a, uh, on a condition on the indices of the interaction graph, which leads to an order and dilution with respect to the fully connected graph. Um, okay, uh, I would just like to, to, to stress that this is okay with standard mode lock lasers, but of course random lasers have a, a, a more complex frequency distribution, so we, we can take it just as a working hypothesis. So the, the model has been uh, solved in the uh, narrow bandwidth approximation where uh, the line width of the single mode has the same, uh, is comparable uh, with the entire bandwidth of the, of, of the spectrum. Uh, so in this case, all the modes uh, have very similar frequencies and the frequency matching condition is uh, uh, always satisfied. So in this case, the graph of interactions is fully connected and one can apply standard replica symmetry breaking uh, mean field techniques. So uh, among the results, one uh, can see a transition to a random laser phase with a one RSB structure via a, a random first order transition and a one to one correspondence between the intensity fluctuation overlap and the Parisi distribution overlaps. However, the diluted case, which is the more realistic one, is still very hard. Uh, in, the meantime, in, in the meantime, we are performing numerical simulations. So, um, in order to uh, study the uh, glass transition, the only relevant part of the Hamiltonian is the nonlinear interaction term. So, let me uh, just uh, um, recap uh, uh, the model. So, the, uh, the effective Hamiltonian. Of the, of the model that we simulated is uh, given by uh, as this expression, where uh, the A are the, are the, um, uh, are the, uh, the, the complex modes of the electromagnetic field, and this J here are uh, quench disorder couplings extracted from a Gaussian distribution. Uh, the stationary probability distribution that we aim to sample uh, is given uh, by uh, this expression where uh, the delta function implements uh, the, 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 um, the spherical constraint which in turn implements gain saturation and this beta here is the inverse of an effective temperature which can be defined in this way in terms of the uh, of the uh, of the pumping rate so uh, I, the results that i will present will be with respect to temperature one has only to keep in mind that high 
pumping rate means low temperature and low pumping rate means high temperature. So uh, this model has all the ingredients for studying the glass transition and the condensation transition since it has disordered couplings and a uh, uh, hard constraint uh, on uh, locally unbounded uh, variables um, and a, a dilution rule. So our numerical strategy is to generate a mod locked uh, graph with a zero mean Gaussian couplings. Then we run uh, parallel tempering Monte Carlo dynamics around the critical temperature for a certain number of identical replicas at equilibrium. And then we repeat for a different extraction of the coupling. And this gives us uh, many uh, samples over which we will average our observables. However, <clears throat> We have a problem because uh, the model of graph is, very, is still very dense, uh, though you have this uh, dilution rule. You start from a fully connected model with the order n to the power of four uh, couplings. You still have n to the power of three couplings. So each mode has order n square couplings. And so the, the, the simulations are very demanding since uh, each update, uh, Monte Carlo update, requires n square uh, operations. So we ran uh, our, uh, our algorithm on, uh, on, the, on GPUs, uh, both for the computation of the energy update and for the simulation of different replicas. However, we still have very low sizes, and so we have to deal with very strong finite size effects. <clears throat> In order to deal with this effect, we uh, implemented a simple trick to reduce to, to reduce them um, by reducing the effect of the of the boundaries. So the the standard way of implementing the frequency matching condition is the uh, is with fixed or free boundary conditions, where the central modes are preferred by the interaction for combinatorial reasons. On the other hand, one can uh, imagine to put the, the modes on a, on a linear chain uh, with respect to the frequencies and to select the modes with the frequency matching condition, but with periodic boundaries. Let's see what is the effect on the, on the spectra. So in the case of, of a fixed boundary condition, uh, uh, we obtain uh, this, uh, this spectra. These spectra are um, for a single instance of the disordered couplings, the temperatures, uh, uh, so the, the red color is associated to a high temperature, while blue color is for low temperature. And as you can see, in the case of free boundary conditions, we can perfectly qualitatively reproduce the, uh, the experimental spectra of random lasers, where you have the global narrowing uh, uh, on the central part of the spectrum and this heterogeneous pattern of peaks uh, on, uh, on the on uh, on uh, on the modes. Uh, when you you do the same with the periodic boundary conditions, uh, you lose we lose the ability of reproducing the, uh, the the global narrowing of the experimental spectra, but we still have uh, uh, the peaks. So uh, this um, this spectrum, in the case of periodic boundary conditions, can be seen as a as a zoom on the central part of the spectrum uh, of a model with fixed boundary condition, but with a very larger size. So it is a, it is a way of uh, reducing the effect of the boundaries. Okay, maybe I will skip this. Uh, okay, let me present our, our results. So we found evidence of a glass transition. Uh, so the mean field scenario of the, uh, on the fully connected model seems to be uh, to hold even in the diluted model. Uh, so in order to study the, the glass transition, which is a, a mixed order uh, transition, we studied both the specific heat for the second order nature and the uh, distribution of the overlaps for the first order nature. Here you can see for the system with periodic boundary conditions, uh, the specific heat, uh, and the same for the system with fixed boundary conditions. Different colors uh, correspond to different uh, sizes uh, of the simulated system. The specific heat has been computed as the fluctuation of thermal, uh, uh, as the thermal fluctuations of, en of energy averaged over many realization of the, of the disorder. And uh, uh, you can see that uh, the, the, the peak increases uh, when uh, the, the temperature is increased as a signal that in the uh, large and limit, uh, the specific heat develops a divergence. 
So we perform the quadratic fit of the uh, central part of, uh, of the specific heat around, the, around its peaks. And from these fits, we were able to assess uh, the critical temperature of, uh, of the model, which is slightly different uh, uh, if one implements the frequency matching condition with the periodic or the fixed boundary uh, conditions. Um, these uh, are the uh, overlap distribution uh, um, functions, both for the periodic boundary conditions and for the fixed boundary conditions. The, the color map is the same as before. So we see that uh, we start from high temperature with a Gaussian uh, distribution, which develops uh, side peaks when lowering the temperature. Uh, and this deviation from Gauss Gaussianity is, uh, can be associated to a, uh, to a breaking of, uh, of replica symmetry. Um, and as you can see, in the case of uh, periodic boundary conditions, we have slightly more pronounced uh, peaks uh, as a consequence of the reduction of, uh, of the finite size effects. Okay. Um, so this, uh, this is all for what concerns the glass transition. Then we uh, performed a finite size scaling of uh, the, the specific heat by collapsing the points around, uh, around the peaks. And the best collapse has been obtained with, this, uh, uh, with these exponents. Uh, so how do we interpret our results? We, we, uh, in, we performed a simple and very general... Um, yeah, Jacopo, you have, you have five minutes. Okay, I'll try to speed up. So uh, we, we developed a simple uh, mean field argument for the scaling of the critical region with the sides of the system, which in the case of a dense network of interaction is the number of variables. So if you take uh, a generic uh, Landau potential where uh, phi is the global order parameter of the transition, tau is the uh, reduced temperature, and uh, you take a generic uh, nonlinearity, um, Okay, what, what we want to do is to uh, compute the fluctuations above the critical temperature, below the critical temperature, and match them. So above the critical temperature, the probability distribution of the order parameter can be approximated with a Gaussian, and the fluctuations are just given by the variance of, uh, of this Gaussian. Whereas below uh, the critical temperature, you cannot neglect the, uh, the nonlinear part of, of the potential, uh, and then you, uh, we, you have to compute a subtle point computation to, uh, to find the minimum of, of the potential. And we define the matching region as, uh, as uh, um, the region in temperature where the uh, fluctuations are of the same order of uh, the distance of, of the minimum from, uh, from the origin. Uh, this is, of course, is, uh, uh, is true only very close to the critical point, but this is precisely where we want to be to match the fluctuations. So in this case, uh, the, the fluctuations are just given by the square of, uh, of uh, the, the subtle point. And matching the fluctuation, we get this relation between the, uh, the, the, the critical uh, region, uh, the, 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 the reduced temperature of the critical region, and uh, the size of the system. Here, if you put n equal to, which corresponds to taking uh, a 5 fourth uh, standard Landau potential, you get uh, an upper bound for, uh, for, the, for this uh, scaling, which is given by this uh, uh, exponent 2. Whereas, uh, if, you put, if you send n to infinity, you find a lower bound, which is given by this exponent 1. So, um, OK. Uh, here, I, I just want to... to show you what happens with the uh, two other uh, models. So here uh, we have the same study of the specific heat for the random energy model, which is the paradigm of the glass transition. And you see that the collapse is obtained with, the, uh, with an, a new effective of two. Whereas uh, in the randomly diluted four-phasor model, which is um, a, a four-phasor model where the dilution is not uh, uh, deterministic uh, and implemented to the frequency matching condition, but is random, uh, the collapse is obtained uh, as well with an exponent uh, 2. So both these models are in the, in the same universality class, uh, in, in the, in, which is the universality class of the phi fourth theory. On the other hand, uh, what we get is a, is a slightly different result because with, uh, with this correlated topology and with periodic boundary condition, we get an exponent which falls inside the mean field uh, interval that we derived, but it's not uh, equal to two. 
So the model of for phasor model seems to be compatible with mean field theory, but also in a but also in a different universality class with respect to uh, the FIFO theory. So now I would, would just like to uh, tell you the results about the pseudo localization transition. So if I have time, but uh, interrupt me if I am late. So this is the partition function of, uh, of our model where uh, the energy conservation is implemented through a soft constraint in the canonical ensemble, whereas the uh, conservation of the intensity is implemented through a hard constraint through a delta function. So in this case, where we have locally uh, unbounded variables, configurations exist where an extensive amount of the intensity is carried by a finite number of modes. And this is impossible with locally bounded variables. So if uh, uh, a value of the intensity exists such, as, such that these localized configurations become uh, thermodynamically relevant, then for uh, values of the energy above the, this critical value, you, you are in a, lo in a localized uh, phase. Uh, here is a subtle point. In our simulations, we keep fix, uh, fix the, the uh, spherical constraint and, and vary the temperature, but uh, we can see this, the, the transition, the condensation transition in temperature rather than varying the constraint uh, with rescaled variables. So this is just the marginal distribution of uh, the spectral intensity where you can see that there is a deviation from a Gaussian behavior at high temperature. So at high temperature, it's, Gau it's uh, uh, exponential, I'm sorry. And at low temperature, it develops a, a bump. This bump is bet can be better seen uh, with, single, with single samples. However, this is not a, a, it's just a hint that there may be a localization transition, but you have to perform a, a study in the large end limit to, uh, to assess that there is uh, actually a condensation transition. In order to do that, we studied uh, both the participation ratio and uh, the effective uh, uh, number of degrees of freedom. From the participation ratio, we didn't get, uh, um, uh, okay, you, you, you can see that there's something is happening at low temperature, but uh, um, the scaling of, of the points in the low temperature region is not compatible with the, a condensation transition in the large end limit. Um, on the other hand, from the study of the effective uh, fraction of degrees of freedom, we find evidence of a, a breaking of equipartition. Um, so we are in a we have found a hybrid phase that is not completely uh, localized, but it's surely not uh, equiparted. Um, okay, maybe I can skip this. If you have question, you can ask and go to the conclusion. So we found evidence of a glass transition in the mode lock for phasor model, uh, as revealed by the specific heat divergence and the presence of uh, side peaks in the Parisi overlap distribution. The finite size scaling of the specific heat reveals that the mode lock for phasor model is compatible with mean field theory, even if it is not in the same universality class of the uh, random energy model. Um, we found evidence of intensity with partition breaking, even if not in terms of a proper condensation transition. Uh, and maybe the most interesting thing uh, that is to say is that the two transitions occur at the same critical temperature as two simultaneous manifestations of the same underlying phenomenon, which is ergodicity breaking, which re reveals itself as uh, the breaking of uh, uh, replica symmetry uh, for the glass transition and the breaking of uh, equipartition um, for localization. So here are work in progress and perspectives, but I just let you read it and I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Jacopo. Thank you. Uh, okay, so okay, so there are two questions. I, I don't know who is the first one who raised, so let's go in alphabetical order. Marco Baiesi. No. Uh, so just a quick question. So what's the distribution of the overlap that you expect in the thermodynamic limit? Uh, it's, I don't think it is uh, well. Okay, with respect to the our results, our finite size results. So the fact yeah, that the, the, 80 the, is already quite large, but probably you yes. Can. Yes, okay. Of course, it is a Gaussian in, at high temperature, and this is a finite size effect. It should be 
a, a delta function in, in zero. But however, in the low temperature region, we still expect that uh, you have uh, a, a peak uh, in, in zero because here we are working with uh, continuous variables. Okay, so um, I expect that in the large end limit, uh, the, it becomes more uh, uh, narrow around zero in the high temperature region, and that both the side peaks and the central peak uh, still uh, remain in the low temperature uh, uh, in the low temperature region, but become deltas. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, so Saverio Pascazio. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. So I'm wondering about something. So uh, it's clear that there is a godicity uh, breaking and it's an interesting model, but I do not see the connection between the model you're studying and the and a spin glass. I mean, you're using completely different variables. So I, I understand the physic that physically the two models are related. It's no doubt that they are related. But is there any way to validate the idea that this is a, a close to a spin glass? Uh, thank you for the question, but I didn't really get uh, the, the point. Uh, are you talking about the correspondence between our spin glass model and the, the, um, the, the random lasers? Or uh, Because if you consider this Hamiltonian, this, this, this is a spin glass. So you have... You have um, complex variables instead of spins okay but this is this is fine you have a, a, a global constraint which uh, uh, on these variables so you it's just like having a spherical model but with complex variables and then you have uh, uh, random couplings so the model that we, we maybe I, I wasn't clear but the model that uh, we have simulated has, has this Hamiltonian yeah, no, this is clear, but this is not a spin glass, I'm sorry. A spin glass is expressed in terms of sigmas. You are using A's. So I understand the physical analogy, but this is not what is called a spin glass in the literature. I'm telling you this not because I believe that the model is incorrect, but because before the, the Nobel Prize to Giorgio Parisi, there were a lot of, dis of discussions about whether a spin glass model can be validated by another model expressed, for instance, in terms of A and A dagger, uh, A and A bar, sorry. So mm -hmm. it is not a question, it's not, I, I would say, maybe, my maybe, own question. Maybe. This is not a spin glass period. Yeah, no. I mean, you understand the physical analogy, but mathematically, it's not a spin glass. It's not a spin glass uh, because it has not real variables. This is what you're saying. No, or because, because a, a spin glass is expressed in terms of sigmas, and yes, sigmas ice, can ice take. Spins. Sorry, Ising spins. Yes, Ising spins. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I, I, I'm. I think I'm. I'm fine with that. But, mm, but you, you know, you have uh, p-spin models with the uh, real variables which are used to describe the glass transition. So here is maybe we. Mm, so it is more a glass model than, than a spin glass model, but. Okay, thank you for the questions. Is there any other question? Okay, if not, uh, I thank uh, again uh, both speakers uh, and uh, all participants. Uh, and uh, so, Let's see again uh, next month.